In our third and last video on discriminant analysis, we're going to look at integrating misclassification costs and oversampling directly into the algorithm. This is special for discriminant analysis and not available in many other algorithms. So let's first see what we mean by misclassification costs and oversampling. Remember the confusion matrix, also called the classification matrix, where we can compare the actuals and the predicted counts. The white cells in this confusion matrix correspond to the correct predictions. So we have A records that were correctly classified as C1, and we have D records correctly classified as C2. The red cells show us misclassifications. So for example, we have B records that were classified as C2, but in fact, they were C1s, and vice versa for this cell down here. We can attach to each one of these records a cost of misclassifying. And these costs don't necessarily need to be the same. So for example, misclassifying a C1 might be more costly or less costly than misclassifying a C2. We want to incorporate such costs, which I'll denote by Q1 for cost of misclassifying C1, and Q2 for misclassifying C2. We're going to incorporate these directly into the algorithm so that we can find a discriminant analysis model that produces the best results given these costs. Let's look at the other scenario that we can include directly into the algorithm. That's what's called oversampling or a distorted sample. What we mean by this is that the ratio of classes, say the acceptors and the non-acceptors in the sample, does not reflect or correspond to that ratio in the population. In this little diagram here, you see different samples where the ratios, for example, in the top sample, do not correspond to the same ratio of red to blue in the entire population. Now, when would this actually happen? And why would you intentionally oversample? Stop the video and try and think of practical reasons why you would oversample. Now, the ordinary and general approach, which applies to any classification method, not only discriminant analysis, would be to incorporate these costs directly into some kind of a cost measure. One such measure is called the average cost per classified record. For every new record that you're going to classify, what is going to be the cost on average? We can do this by multiplying the cost of misclassifying a, a C1 record times the number of records that we misclassify as C1s, plus the cost of misclassifying a C2 record times the number of records that we classify mistakenly as C2. And we divide this entire sum by the total sample. This gives us the average cost per classified record. Now take a look at what we can do to this very nice and small formula. We can expand it simply by multiplying and dividing by a plus b in the left side here. And here we're going to divide and multiply by c plus d. So obviously these two formulas are the same. However, when I write it out this way, it is easy to show how we can incorporate these different sample ratios or oversampling into this measure. For example, I can adjust for a distorted sample if I know the population ratios of classes. Instead of using this a plus b over n, which is the ratio of class C1 in my sample, and this is c plus d over n, the ratio of C2 in my sample, I can replace these with different proportions, which I think are more reflective of those ratios in the population of interest. So once again, this is a general way to approach and incorporate oversampling and costs into the metric that measures predictive accuracy. With discriminant analysis, we don't necessarily need to use that method because with discriminant analysis, we can directly incorporate both misclassification costs and external class ratios into the classification scores. Remember that we use these classification scores to generate a classification for new records. The way we're gonna do this is we're going to modify the constant if you remember, the classification scores have a constant, as well as coefficients for each and every one of the predictors in the model. We can also think about this conceptually as generating 
class probabilities for new records, and then putting some kind of a cutoff value on those probabilities to generate a class. By modifying the constant, it's identical to actually changing the cutoff from the classic standard 0.5 to a different value that would account for the misclassification costs and for oversampling. Excel Miner allows to do this through a menu that's called Prior Class Probabilities and Misclassification Costs, and other software might also have those options. Let's look at how we do this directly in LDA. Suppose we have a two-class problem. Our y can only be a yes or a no, or a 0 or a 1. In that case, we're going to have classification functions for one class and for the other class. In each one, we're going to have a constant. The way to incorporate costs and prior probabilities or external probabilities is simply to add this amount, log, natural log, of p1, which is the probability of class 1, times the cost of misclassifying c1, which is q1. We're going to add this to the constant of the classification function for class 1. We'll do the same thing by adding this amount, log of p2 times q2, to the constant of class 2. Now notice that my slide says add this quantity to the classification score. This is exactly the same as adding this quantity to the constant, since the classification score is equal to the constant plus all the other components. So this is the solution for a two-class problem. We can simplify this even further, and instead of adding the amount log of p1 times q1 to the class 1 scores and log of p2 times q2 to the class 2 scores, we can simply divide one by the other and add log of p2 times q2 divided by p1 times q1 only to the class 2 classification scores or constant. So either you do this or that, they're mathematically equivalent. And the software might choose one or the other approach, but in both cases, you're getting the same effect. What happens when we have more than two classes? Well, the good news and the bad news, we can still incorporate these prior probabilities or external class probabilities by adding a log of pj to each class score, but here we can't really incorporate the costs directly. Since most problems are two class problems, just remember that there's a way to do this directly. Let's look at an example. I'm going to return to the same personal loan offer data set and example that we looked at in the previous two videos. Remember again that the bank is using data from a previous campaign where they mailed 5,000 customers a loan offer, and of these 5,000 customers, 480 accepted the loan offer. The model that we got based on this data set was presented in the first video on discriminant analysis. We got this classification function with a classification function for the acceptors and another one for rejections. Each of these has a constant and a coefficient for income and for credit card average spending. Notice that when you ran the procedure in Excel Miner, the default was use prior class probabilities that are equal. In other words, generating this set of classification functions assumes, number one, that the misclassification costs are identical if you misclassify an acceptor and you misclassify a rejector. And number two, we're assuming that there are 50% acceptors and 50% rejectors in the population. That is the default as specified in Excel Miner. That might be different in other software. So how can we adjust this if we don't want to make these assumptions? If we want to incorporate different mis misclassification costs, or if we want to use a different ratio of acceptors to rejectors in the population? Let's first think about what is the population. In our case, the only information that we have is that they use data from a previous campaign on 5,000 customers, of whom 480 accepted the offer. What we did before is we assumed that 50% in the population would accept, in theory, the loan. That gave us this classification function. However, is that a reasonable number? Do 50% of customers receiving a loan offer really accept, based on the data that we have, what would be your best guess? 
One option would be to say, well, let's take the numbers that we have up here and say that 480 over 5,000 is a reasonable guess for the proportion of acceptors in the population. That would give us 0 0.095. Another option is to say, well, we split the data into training and holdout sets, so let's only take the training set, which in, in our case was 3,000 records, and among them, we can count and find that only 286 people accepted the offer. So another way to estimate the true, if you want, uh, percent of loan acceptors is to divide 286 by 3,000, which gives us 0 0.0953. If I want to recompute the classification functions based on these numbers, all I need to do is choose a different option in Excel Miner's menu. And here you can see I can choose prior class probabilities according to the relative occurrence in training data. When I run this, I'll get a different set of classification functions. Now compare these two, and you'll notice that the only difference is in the constants. All the other coefficients are identical. In other words, changing the prior probabilities or the population ratio of classes affects the constant by adding or subtracting a certain number to the constant where we have a 50-50 breakdown. How did we do this? We add log of P1 times Q1 to the class 1 constant, and we add log P2 times Q2 to the class 2 constant. If you want to do the actual algebra and get these two numbers, here's how we did it. Theoretically, what we need to do is simply take the numbers from the top, negative 7.59576, and add log, natural log, of 0 0.0953. However, you'll notice that you won't get the number that Excel Miner gives you. The reason here is that Excel Miner also subtracts the 50-50 that generated the numbers at the top. This is a small detail and not very important. You'll notice that the same number is subtracted from the reject class. Now go ahead and try it for yourself. Suppose that in the true population, only 3% of bank customers tend to accept a loan offer. How can I take this original classification functions that I generated by a 50-50 assumption, how can I modify this so that I get new classification functions that better predict in the case of 3% of customers accept the offer? Stop the video and see if you can figure out the calculation. Notice that modifying the classification functions directly affects the classification of new records. For example, suppose that we have a customer with an income of 150 and credit card average spending equal to 1. We can compute their scores for accepting and for rejecting using the classification functions that we generated, just as we did earlier on. And notice that if we use the 50-50 accept-reject ratio, it looks like the acceptance score is much higher. In other words, we classify this particular customer as an acceptor, and we would send them a loan offer. However, if the truth is that not 50% of people accept the offer, but rather only 3% accept the offer, we get a different set of classification functions. And if we compute the scores based on this new set of functions, we'll get a different result. In this result, we see that the rejection score tends to be higher for this same customer, and therefore we would classify this person as rejecting the offer, and we would not actually send them the offer. So notice that incorporating prior probabilities, or accounting for a distorted sample, directly affects the classification of new records. In our initial analysis, we assumed a 50% acceptance to rejections ratio, and also we assumed equal costs. You can see this in the Excel Miner menu here, where the misclassification cost of success is 1, and a failure is 1. And this was the set of classification functions that we just got. But how about if we change this so that not only we modify the probability of acceptance to be lower, but we also assign a much higher cost of misclassifying and acceptance. In other words, it's much worse to miss someone who would have accepted your loan rather than misclassifying someone who would not accept your loan. If I run this in Excel Miner, I'm going to enter this 10 right here, 
and leave this as 1, and you'll see that we get a different set of classification functions. Again, notice that the only difference is in terms of the constant. All the other coefficients remain unchanged. Can you think about which direction these constants would change? If we're making it more difficult to accept an offer and making it more expensive to misclassify an acceptor, should these constants go up or down? Stop the video and try and think about the effect of each of these factors. Let's see how we did the constant calculation. Remember the formula that we had early on. Remember that we need to multiply the probability, this is our P1, times the cost of misclassification. In order to get this constant of negative 7.5699, which is the constant in the accept group, we're also going to have to remove these numbers, which are in red, Again, this is a small detail, but this is the way Excel Minor does the computation by re removing the 50% and also normalizing the entire costs. The same can be done for the reject numbers. Now see if you figured out how to do this. So let's again assume that the rate of acceptors in the population is 0.0953. And let's again assume that the cost of misclassifying an acceptor is 10 times worse than misclassifying a rejector. We have Ms. Jojo, who earns an income of 150, and her credit card average spending is equal to 1. How would you classify Ms. Jojo? Would she be an acceptor? Would you send her a loan offer? Or would she be classified as a non-acceptor? Use all the information here to figure out whether Ms. Jojo should be classified as an acceptor or a non-acceptor. To summarize, let's go back to all three videos. Number one, we can use discriminant analysis for profiling or for classifying new records. Number two, discriminant analysis is a model-based classifier. It uses statistical distance as the basis of measuring distances between a record and a class. Those are then used to generate scores. A higher classification score leads to class membership decisions. We can also compute probabilities of class membership given the scores. Discriminant analysis is a model-based method which has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that it will work pretty well even with small samples. The disadvantage is that we have to make sure that some of these assumptions are really not violated too badly. For example, the equal correlation in each class. Finally, what we saw in this video is that we can incorporate misclassification costs and external class probabilities or oversampling directly into the algorithm so that it produces classification functions that generate the best results. If you want to learn more details about discriminant analysis, this is a great time to go and read the chapter in the book.